All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you for coming. So I'm speaking into this microphone, which seems a little odd because there's no like speaker. But we are streaming this presentation or this event to an audience of which I'm sure is thousands online, or at least two. Um, so once again, thanks for coming. I'm Kenrick Mock. I'm the interim dean for the College of Engineering. And um, this is the first time we've had this journey into engineering event, so I hope you find it helpful. Um, we are here in the EIB, the Engineering and Industry Building. And we actually have two buildings for the College of Engineering. Um, we have the EIB, and we also have the ECB, the Engineering and Computation Building, which is across the, across the way a little bit. So you'll mostly get a tour, I think, of just this building, but you know, if, you have, if you're interested, we can arrange something for the other building as well. And one of the reasons why we have two buildings is we've had lots of growth in engineering. So around five years ago, we had maybe 800 students in engineering, and today we have closer to 1,400. And um, with part of that growth, we've got new buildings and new facilities. And when you get the tour here, you'll see some of the labs um, that we have to offer for our students and our researchers and faculty. So we're here for mechanical engineering, but we also have other degrees in engineering here. So tomorrow, we have an event for computer science and computer systems engineering. Um, Wednesday is geomatics and, geo, geomatics and civil engineering. I, I started to say geospatial engineering because geomatics is in the process of changing their bachelor's degree name. Uh, from GMAX to geospatial engineering. Um, and then on Thursday, we have electrical engineering. And for all of these programs, the bachelor's of science degrees are all fully accredited um, by ABIT, that's our accrediting agency. And right now is a really good time to be an engineer. There's lots of job opportunities worldwide, you know, nationwide, and especially here in Alaska. Uh, one of the things that we hear from employers is they bring engineers up from outside, and after a winter here um, of darkness and snow, they decide it's not for them, and they take off, and, and these companies would really like some homegrown engineers that want to stay in Alaska. So if you're interested in staying here, not only are there lots of really cool job opportunities, um, but, but they're, you're needed here. And the jobs are pretty, pretty exciting. Um, we've got graduates that are working for places like NASA, uh, BP, um, Google, Tesla, and not only are they you know, really high paying jobs, but they're really fun, exciting jobs where you get to work on things like make an electric self-driving car, or how can you construct this bridge? So this bridge over here through the, through the window was uh, designed by one of our alumni. So with that little introduction, um, I'm going to turn it over to the Chair of Mechanical Engineering, Dr. Jifeng Peng. Thank you, Kenrick. Hi, everybody, uh, students and uh, uh, parents. Uh, thank you for coming to today's Journey into Engineering event. Uh, um, as King Mark was saying that this is a week long. Uh, this is going to be a week long event for all the programs at uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. And today we are going to focus on our program, mechanical engineering. So, uh, can we do a show of hands to see whether um, how many of you guys are uh, interested in mechanical engineering? Okay, some of them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, so first, uh, uh, just a, a few. Uh, uh, a little introduction to our programs. Uh, when I say programs, uh, so we do have a, a Bachelor of Science program and we also have a Master of Science program. So um, as Kim, Kim Mark was saying that uh, for the past few years that our uh, programs, all the programs actually has grown a lot, uh, especially for the mechanical engineering program. Uh, our, so as you can see the chart here, the left chart here shows the, the enrollment over the years for the um, mechanical engineering program, uh, undergraduate program. So you can see we, um, we uh, in 2012, we were at uh, 270, and now we uh, 
topped uh, 350 uh, in, uh, active enrollment students. And the right-hand side chart, you can see that's our uh, number of the graduates uh, from our program. So you can see we, um, like uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, we were like uh, a little bit about 20 students per year uh, graduation, but now we will, we are at 40 to even 50 uh, graduate graduate student um, student graduate every year. And uh, as a matter of fact, the mechanical engineering program is the the largest engineering program uh, in the state of Alaska. And uh, also, as uh, our program uh, is ABET accredited, actually one of uh, my colleague, um, Professor um, Jenny Brock there, she, uh, she is uh, an ABET reviewer, so she's very active in, in the ABET accreditation. So basically, she goes to other, uh, other universities to accredit their programs. So, so we do have the expert here uh, to help us to get accredited. So, um, so you don't have to worry about uh, the accreditation for our program. Okay, so uh, and we also have a Master of uh, Science program. So basically, if you are uh, after you get your your BS degree, you are interested in continue to do some um, further education, then we do have the the Master program for you. And uh, uh, especially, we have a a fast track program for our. Uh, undergraduate students. So let's say if you graduate from our undergraduate student here, and then you can actually, you are eligible to go to this fast track program. So the benefit is that usually a graduate student will need 30 uh, credit to graduate, but uh, if you are into the fast track program, you only need 24 credits to graduate. So um, so usually uh, it's three credits per course. So you can see for the fast track, you only need to take an average of eight courses. So you can pretty done that pretty fast. Okay. So so most of our students are eligible as long as you keep a, a good GPA a requirement, as you can say, 3.25. And uh, for the for the graduate program, the department and the college do provide. Uh, um, some financial support in the form of tuition waiver and the teaching assistantship and also research assistantship. So there are a lot of uh, financial opportunities. So, so if you are thinking about the, the, the tuition or like a concern, then uh, we do have some uh, 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 opportunities there for you to continue uh, for the master program. So I'm not going to talk about too many things uh, in the program, but I do want to emphasize a few of our uh, student clubs. As you know, um, as a faculty member, we do our instructions in the classroom, and we also uh, work with the student outside the, the classroom, outside the in traditional introduction. So, um, so I know that's probably the, the things you guys are most interested in. So, uh, so I'm going to, to to spend some time on that. So today we invited a few student clubs here, and uh, so one of them is uh, is the Seawolf Motorsports. So that's that's Matthew and the Brandon there. So, so basically, uh, um, they design this Baja car and they, they go to a national competition. Uh, it's a competition from Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, they have been doing this since 2010, and uh, um, uh, they go there mo most of every year, right? Every year, and then um, so they compete with all uh, a lot of universities. Sometimes more than hundreds of teams from all the universities around the, the United States, and some uh, even some international teams. So uh, they mostly place really well, like in the ha half. Top uh, top half of the the competition. Okay, so uh, if you guys have any questions, you can talk with uh, Matt and uh, Brandon over there. Okay, so um, another student club which uh, which is fairly new but very active uh, is the robotics. So we also have the robotics team over there. Uh, they also brought their uh, that's Elliot who is waving to you guys and. Uh, and they brought their robotics uh, robots today here. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that there's a Baja car downstairs. Uh, we couldn't bring it upstairs because it doesn't fit into the elevator. So you can feel feel free to go downstairs in the lobby. You can see it. Okay. So um, so the robotics uh, uh, has 
the ME student and also have elect electrical engineering student and also computer science students. So I think they started a couple of years ago. Uh, right now they are building a robot for the university rover challenge project. So that's a premier robotic for the, for the college students. Um, I think they just passed the 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 uh, the task to actually go to the competition. So it, it's, the competition is very selective. You cannot just say I want to go there, and then you will go there. You have to design it and then uh, uh, meet some criterions and then basically be selected into the the competition. I think they are going to the competition this year. Okay, so. Uh, uh, we also have a, a Rocky Tree Club here. Uh, I don't think uh, they are here today, but uh, um, so they started uh, a few years back. And uh, so they basically they go to the NASA's uh, annual student launch competition. So you can see on the uh, left bottom, that's some of the rockets they, they, they built. And uh, so um, I remember in 2015 they went to the the, the competition and uh, they competed with many universities uh, like a like a um, uh, UIUC like MIT. Uh, they placed their rocket placed six out of the 22 uh, teams and they they also won a a a, a, a individual award uh, called University Level Rocket Fair Award. So so um, here are some of uh, the students who graduated from the the our program who were also in uh, in this club so um, so they went down to work with a lot of aerospace companies like uh, SpaceX um, Nordstrom Grumman so Nordstrom Grumman is a, a, a very big aerospace company military contractor and also um, uh, so another student Jordan Singo he he went down to uh, to be as a graduate student at the US Naval uh, Academy okay so uh, so that's some, that's the introduction of some of our student clubs. So the faculty members here work closely with the student fac student uh, clubs, um, and also um, our faculty members, my colleagues, they also help the student motivate the student to do in in individual uh, research project. So I'm just going to show a couple of examples. Uh, so this is a a, a faculty student research project, uh, otherwise by Professor Cooling over there. So um, he is our corrosion expert. So uh, um, uh, Professor Cooling and uh, a couple of other co my colleagues, uh, Professor Srin Wasang uh, and also Professor Peterson. Uh, Professor Peterson is from Double E Department. So um, they are doing an active ongoing project on. Uh, Corrosion under uh, insulation. So they are designing some um, some um, probes and uh, vessels to test the the uh, corrosion probes. So many students has worked with Professor Cooling on on his project. So uh, this this student here, Peter Renner, he he graduated two years ago. He got, he um, he's at um, Texas A and M doing corrosion research right now as a PhD student, and he actually. Um, uh, with um, um, before he 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 went to um, uh, Texas A and M, he got a a fellowship, graduate fellowship from NSF. This is a very difficult fellowship to get. So basically, the fellowship give you uh, five years tuition waivers and then stipend, all the things for you to continue your uh, your research as a PhD uh, PhD student. Uh, if you get that uh, fellowship, you can pretty much go to any universities you want. Um, so um, uh, this is an example of another project. This is advised by uh, Professor Lubantu. Um, so basically, they are studying some uh, using compliant mechanism to design flexible hinges. So, so, so basically, um, you can say this hinge is not just like a, the, your traditional like door hinge. is is made from just one piece of metal, but it's Flexible, so it can be, so it can act as a hinge. So, um, so uh, the faculty member and uh, the student they work together in uh, what type of studies, like simulation, like experimental studies. So, um, many of the students also work on, on this project, and uh, some of uh, one, so some of them want to to continue their education in graduate schools, like a. Uh, 
um, one of the students get recently got an admission to Purdue and Northwestern, and uh, another student is continue here at the UA for her uh, master program. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, in, um, in addition to uh, classroom instruction, the faculty here and all the students, they work on all type of interesting project. Uh, actually, I have with in many universities, those, those, those projects, those student clubs are exactly the same project those, those top universities has been, has been working on. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that we want, as a department, we want to provide students a lot of opportunities, not only in the classroom, in a conventional classroom setting, but also provide for the students some exciting experience working on different things. So, so that's the end of my, uh, my introduction to our program and our student achievements. Okay. Uh, so, um, so for today's event, uh, um, so we invited. So, in addition to to you guys, we also invited uh, uh, some of our uh, alumni to come here. So, so if you guys have questions, you can ask them. So, I'm going to introduce them. So, so back there, that's um, Alex and the Kelly uh, Bergeron. So. So they are both our uh, graduates from quite a few years back, right? Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, so, um, so Kelly is with Conical Philips now, and uh, that's Delphine Dyer here. Uh, so uh, Delphine graduated two years ago. Um, so uh, she is with uh, BP uh, right now. So, so if you guys have any question to our uh, to our uh, alumni, feel free to ask. Okay. So, do you guys want to say any words or? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I also want to mention that most of the students after they graduate, they work. Um, so some of them go out of state, and some of them stay here. So the industries they typically go to is uh, so um, in Alaska, as you can see, mostly um, oil and gas. That's the one of the biggest industry of a student go to. And uh, um, so HVAC, so basically heating and the ventilation. That's another uh, industry. So they go to work with. Um, uh, Siemens or some other uh, HVAC companies. Uh, uh, some of our students they also go to work with uh, aerospace uh, industry. Um, so, uh, like SpaceX, NASA, uh, those those uh, companies, organizations. Okay. Um, okay. So I think there are a few of um, the uh, other faculty members here. I'm going to make the introduction here. So I I think I already introduced um, Professor Jenny Brock back there. So for the who are participating online, it doesn't seem like it's making, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm also the interim associate dean for academics for the college, but mechanical is my home department. I specialize in fluid thermal sciences, so I teach thermodynamics and heat transfer. Um, so if you have any questions about any of those things, and, and also I know a lot about ABET, so I'm the person to ask. Hi, my name is Getu. I am also from Mechanical Engineering Department. Uh, mostly I work in the area of renewable energies, turbo machinery, HVAC. So later I'll be up in my lab. So if you come around and want to look at some machines, I can show you. Okay. Yeah, I'm Matt Cullen. I do corrosion materials, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'll show you around the, if you're interested, I can show you around the lab. 
we do a bunch of materials characterization work here, a bunch of materials testing for the industry as well. So, um, yeah, that's what I do. What else we got? Hi, I'm Anthony Paris. I work in the mechanics, materials, design areas. of your questions um, we we also have our um, a student advisor uh. um, I'm also the faculty advisor for the Society of Women Engineers which is also here tonight um, Society of Women Engineers woo um, and we're more of a professional development society. We, we do a lot with like networking opportunities, resume design, um, and having speakers on campus. So we've got some members here if you wanted to ask about that as well. Thank you. Um, The Baja car stand, so you guys are welcome to, to take what to take one home. Okay, okay so um, I will leave. Um, uh, I will just leave the floor to, to you guys. If you guys have any questions to for any of us, we'll be happy to 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 talk with you. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, aerospace related. So, like you can see, the the Rocky Tree Club. That's uh, that's basic. What they, they do is basic aerospace related. Uh, we do have uh, some aerospace related courses we offer here, like uh, um, aerodynamics, like uh, advanced fluid mechanics. So those type of thing. And also, so when you are talking about aerospace nowadays, aerospace is a it's a big subject, right? It involves a lot of disciplines like uh, like uh, controls like uh, all those type of things right so so we do offer a lot of all those those courses and then we also we are also trying to give you guys some experience outside the classroom so so for those of you guys uh, actually the, our students started the rocketry club so basically um, they are they were interested they basically they, they were self motivated to start to to start the club then we be as a program we basically help them to provide them a platform for their for them to do their their, their things does that answer your question all right thank you yeah sure so so the question is uh, what's the percentage of our graduates who already has the job, right? So, so um, we don't have the the very accurate statistics for that question. So, what we usually do is that before the the, the our students graduate at the basically at the, their last semester, we do a student survey. So, so basically, we ask them whether you have already secured a job. As you can see, um, bef because. Um, we ask the question when the students are still in the still in the program. So sometimes they haven't started looking for a job yet. But we do have some numbers based on our survey. I think Professor Brock can answer that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm actually the one who who runs the survey. So um, 
we, we don't have this year's data yet because we haven't surveyed this year's graduating class, but last year's graduating class, 74% of the people who were actively searching for a job had one before they graduated, um, which is what, you know, we have to do the survey before they graduate. So 74% um, had one by like the last week of classes, had at least one job offer. Um, and then the average starting salary last year was um, either 55 or 60 a per year. That um, does does anybody know? We um, see. I, I will admit we've put that on the survey, um, and a lot of students said no. But I think that's because a lot of our students, an overwhelming number of our students, get engineering summer jobs, but then they don't think of it as an internship. They think of it as I got a summer job. So like on the survey, um, more than half of the students said no, I didn't participate in an internship. But then they answered a bunch of questions about their summer jobs. So unfortunately, the, the last survey didn't capture that data really well, but I think it's because we didn't make it clear that um, summer jobs in engineering, which, which we make you take AutoCAD like your first semester, which makes you employable. So um, a lot of our students do get good engineering summer jobs, but then they don't think to call them internships. So that's a really excellent question. Unfortunately, we do not have accurate data. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to, to ask anything you have in mind. Okay, so uh, if you guys don't want to ask questions now, maybe you can, you guys can uh, talk with our students, talk with our alumni and uh, all the students uh, from the from the the student clubs are there, so if you guys uh, feel more comfortable talking with them, feel free to do so. Uh, and uh, I think um, afterwards we are going to do a couple of um, live tours. So uh, Professor Kulin uh, is going to uh, sh show you guys the uh, the corrosion lab, and uh, Professor Gaitu is going to show you guys the the HVAC lab. So um, uh, what else? Yes, yes. Yes, a lot actually. So the question was, um, do we partner with any of the oil and gas uh, companies uh, for our students to get em uh, get employment over there? So you want to? Yes, I don't think we we have a a a, a formal a formal partnership. So I'm assuming you pointed at me because I do a fair amount of work for oil and gas, the oil and gas industry. Um, we get a lot of projects related to oil and gas. Some of it involves students, some of it's just testing done by our lab. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to network and to come in contact if you, if you get on one of those projects, um, to get in contact with people who work for these companies. Um, and I think most of our graduates will probably tell you a lot of getting your first job is networking. You have to put yourself out there. You have to meet these people. And once you have those connections, it becomes infinitely easier to get a job. Just going online and cold applying to places sometimes gets you in the door, depending on how impressive your resume is. But, you know, having done work for a company prior to them seeing your resume can make a big difference. Having a relationship with the hiring manager, I think, helps. <laughs> Should I stand? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Delphine, and I currently work at BP. I'm not a recruiter, but I get pulled in a lot by the HR department and the recruiters that come out of Houston to come show up at BP. And I can say we don't have a formal partnership with the university, but BP does put an emphasis on hiring locally. And so 
any position that they can fill with a qualified person that lives in Alaska, they typically will. Before I started working full time at BP, I was a student here and I was an intern. And of all the technical degrees that they could fulfill out of Alaska, such as mechanical or electrical engineering, they had a recruit from either UAA or UAF. There are some degrees that aren't offered, such as chemical engineering in Alaska. And so those interns will typically come from other states. But UAA is a targeted school that BP recruits from. I hope that answers the question. The benefit is that um, all the oil producers here, like BP and Conoco, they're just like uh, five minutes, 10 minutes away. So uh, so you would get uh, a lot of our students actually intern for, for those companies. And also not only producers, but also service companies uh, like Shun Bashe, like uh, Baker Hughes. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities uh, um, with those, with those uh, companies for you to do intern for them. Actually, nowadays, I think if you want a permanent job with them, you have to do the intern first. So, so but, uh, okay, so <laughs> some of them don't agree, but, but, uh, but, it, but I would say uh, an, an internship with them will, will help you to get a permanent job over there. So, um, so and you can see that's uh, very important. So you, you are in town, then you can just uh, um, drive there, you can, take the classes for half a day and then intern for half a day, or you can do the internship during the summer. So uh, plenty of opportunities for you guys to interact and work with those, those companies. More questions? Yep. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, um, there there is a student right now in 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 my class, and I'm also sure in your class. Um, so yeah, so they are part of the ROTC, and then sometimes they just wear their uniform to the classes. So we can that's what that's how we, we we can tell. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and actually, as um, the university do have a RT, uh, ROTC um, club here, so basically, I think it's in one of the buildings over there. So they can they get the the social over there, and then you can also so come to the class like uh, take our programs. Um, also, we have an uh, an active chapter of the Society of American Military Engineers um, that's active in Anchorage, and our students get a lot of scholarships from them. On the note that Dr. Brock was saying, I noticed that not a lot of hands came up when the question, are you specifically interested in mechanical came up. No matter what type of engineering you're interested in, look for the professional societies online because there are a lot of scholarships offered already to high school students. So American Society of Mechanical Engineers, American Society of Civil Engineers. There's also an American Society of Professional Engineers. And I remember when I was in college talking to one of the chairs of the scholarship committee who said, yeah, we have thousands of dollars to give away and only two people applied for the scholarship this year. So keep an eye out for those. There's a lot of money in the professional chapter scholarships. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so um, so Matt, you, you you guys want to do the tour first, or you want to do the mingo first? Uh, so um, let's mingo first. Okay, so uh, so let's just spend uh, maybe fifteen minutes so you can talk with everybody, um, and afterwards, um, again, um, Professor Cooling and the Professor. Um, uh, Hailu is going to take you guys to a couple of labs in this building. As Ken, um, uh, Dean Kenrick mentioned, um, there's another building uh, far away from here. That's where uh, ME is based. Uh, I also want to mention we do have a fully equipped machine shop and uh, uh, quite a few 3D printers over there. So, so if you guys, so we use those to help the students do their course project and also some other project, like same same thing as we showed here. So if you guys are interested, 
uh, you guys can use those facilities. Okay. Uh, speaking of facilities, um, uh, I, what I can say is that uh, so the facility, the instructional facility here is is top notch. You probably can't find any better instructional classrooms uh, in any other universities than compared to here because everything is is it's very new. We just renovated it. We built this building and then we renovated it, the other building. So so the, the facility wise, uh, uh, I would say this is uh, our facilities, uh, instructional facility is, is top notch. Okay, so um, feel free to talk with um, any of us if you have any questions. This is one of Three or four labs. So we have uh, a bunch of microscopes. I'll just sort of uncover them here. Um, and so, just uh, as a precursor, I know you're all adults, and I don't need to tell you to not like smash stuff around. But please, you know, just just watch yourself as you're walking around because there's like probably about two million dollars worth of equipment in these labs. So, and a lot of it's like really delicate stuff that you, if you accidentally knock off the table, I will cry. So don't do that to me. Um, yeah, so what we're doing in here most of the time, this is kind of our clean lab. Most of our other labs are a little bit dirtier. Uh, we're examining different material specimens to figure out what they look like on a microscopic or nanoscopic level in order to kind of tie that back to how they behave on a macroscopic level. So a lot of what I do is actually failure analysis. So when something blows up or otherwise fails, people bring the pieces to me and ask, why did this happen? And a big part of how I figure out why it happened is characterizing the material on that microscopic level. So looking at it on one of our light microscopes, that's what these are. There's another light microscope in the center. Most of you probably use light microscopes, right? Biology class or something like that. Um, these are obviously kind of like light microscopes on steroids. Uh, they can just do uh, a lot more fun stuff in terms of polarizing light and revealing things that a regular biological microscope can't. Um, that said, these have kind of the same microscopic of the magnification limits as your biology microscope. So you can see some pretty small things, right? But we're talking 1,000x, 2,000x, right? And does, it, does everybody remember from biology class, you, you turn the focus styles, right? And it's, it's all blurry, it's all blurry, and then whoop, it's clear, then it gets all blurry again. That's what's called depth of field. And so you can only see one perfectly flat plane. Awesome if you're looking at flat things. Right? You're looking at cells on a slide, something like that, not a problem. But what happens when I look, want to look at a surface of a piece of metal that got ripped apart and it's all jagged and I, know, I can't look at them with these, right? And so I'll show you next what we use for that. But yeah, this is kind of where we start. If we're, if we're taking a piece of, uh, let's say, a metal and we want to know, you know, uh, is there anything wrong with it structurally? A lot of times we'll mount it, we'll polish it, we'll etch it with acid to reveal what's going on, and then we will be able to look at it in the light microscope. And a lot of times it's just a matter of, when you've looked at enough of this stuff, you'll find, you'll see like, oh, what are those little black spots? Well, that's bad, right? It's not supposed to look like that. Which, in the end, why they pay me money to do failure analysis is because somebody just lost a lot of money because something blew up or failed, right? And everybody wants to know who's responsible, who's paying the bill. So in that case, if I find something wrong with the original material, the answer is the person that actually made the material is responsible, and they're going to pay for it. So it's not the operator sitting out there turning the valve. He, did, he or she did their job. It was the mill that manufactured the metal that messed up. And so BP or whoever will go back to them and say, yeah, you owe us like two or three million dollars for this failure. Um, and they'll have to basically pony up cash because they produced a bad product. Just give you some, some background on sort of like why we have all this fancy stuff, right? Um, actually, the thing behind you is, that's a 3D scanner. So uh, it's actually, that's the computer. The thing sitting next to it right there, the little stage, that's a micro stage. So there's a little, basically, uh, that pen on top. It uses optical interferometry, um, which is a fancy way of it just looks at how the light is reflected back and refracted. And it essentially, the the micro stage just scans along the surface and it produces that 3D image over there. And I, I'm genuinely not even sure what the lab tech is 
I don't know what uh, what project this is actually for, what he's scanning, but I'm assuming it was some failure that somebody wanted analyzed and they wanted it scanned. So if you need 3D microscopic sort of dimensioning, that's kind of the way to go. Uh, yeah, give me an idea of the tools we have. If you come over here, I'll show you some of the other tools. They get progressively more expensive as you move around here. So, um, This is our very fancy welder. You can just like kind of cram up in here. You're not gonna like um, call it a fancy welder, right? It's optical emission spectroscopy. So has anybody seen a welding torch in action? Really bright, right? Bright light. You basically get a whole bunch of voltage and you jump an arc, a lightning bolt onto the metal, right? And that light that comes off, right? Essentially, you're you're vaporizing a little bit of that metal. So what this thing does is it it sparks and hits that surface of the metal um, and creates that light. But as it turns out, every element on the periodic table has its own fingerprint of light that it gives off. And this one splits all the different wavelengths up and figures out how many, essentially what the intensity of the light is in each wavelength. And then the computer backs out exactly what's in the metal based on that. So this is another one of those, somebody sends me, let's say, 4340 steel and says, hey, is this 4340? Does this meet the spec? You look up the spec for 4340, which is just a grade of steel, right? And you look at what is supposed to be in it. Well, it's supposed to have this much carbon. It's supposed to have this much chromium, this much molybdenum, right? This is what tells us whether it actually does or doesn't have that, right? So it's actually a really big first step of the, this is, I would say this is the somebody really messed up in terms of like, they just grabbed a bolt and they didn't grab the right bolt. This is how we catch that most of the time. It's like, oh, we got six bolts, two of them failed. What's the difference between the one that failed and the one that didn't? A lot of times it's just a straight chemical thing. It's just, oh, they were somebody, you know how when you're like at Home Depot or whatever and you pick a bolt and it's in the wrong bin? Yeah, it happens with big stuff too. So when that happens, this is kind of how we catch it. Uh, yeah, this gets its own room because it's a quarter million dollars. So come on in. <laughs> This is our scanning electron microscope. And there should be, can you reach behind there? There should be a slider light. You see it? Light switch. Just slide it up. Yeah. Oh, wait, so. Uh, there you go. That's what a quarter million dollars looks like. So this is, uh, if, if anything ever goes down uh, to the state of Alaska, my plan is to just take this thing, put it on the back of my truck, drive it out of the state. So <laughs> this, is my, this is my golden parachute. Um, and so we have the light microscopes out there that your useful magnification is around 1,000x, 1,200x, somewhere in that range. Well, instead of using light, this uses electrons to create the image on the surface. So you get an image, a, micro, a magnified image of the surface, but it's electrons rather than light that creates it. And so... This is the electron gun. It basically, you, you force a really high voltage between the specimen, which down here inside a vacuum chamber. And then you force the electrons into a beam. And then there's a, a, essentially electromagnetic lenses in here that focus the beam to a spot on your specimen, right? Um, so it's basically, you know, this giant electron gun. Um, it has to be a vacuum because air actually scatters electrons. So your beam would look all fuzzy. Right? You wouldn't get a good clear image, but that's how we get images up to, we're talking 150,000 X. So light microscopes will take you to like 2000 X. If you're pushing it, these do 150,000 X. So we can see, uh, to be honest with you, I can get way higher mag on these than I ever need. It's one of those, I just keep zooming in and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. Like, cause you're so close. Can't quite see the atoms. You're not quite down to that level with this. Um, but it's close enough that you know, essentially, you're just like, well, I, didn't, I didn't even know what I'm looking at. This is so small. Most of the things that cause big failures and most of the traces of big failures usually fall in the 30,000 X range, somewhere in there. So that's usually where I hang out. And I just cruise around this micro stage and I just kind of cruise around on the sample and look for things that shouldn't be there or that tell me what happened, why it happened, things like that. When I don't know what something is, I turn on that guy. So that's EDS, energy dispersal spectroscopy. So when we bombard the surface of our samples with electrons, it excites the electrons into the outer shells. And when they fall back down, they give off 
uh, x-rays at particular energy levels. And that little thing, all it does is just sit there and count all those uh, x-rays and essentially what energy level they're at. Same kind of concept as the OES in that every element up there gives off a fingerprint, right? So when I get a spectra for, of all the things that I'm on that surface that I'm looking at at that point, basically the computer says, yeah, that's like 5% sulfur, 35% iron. It backs out exactly what I'm looking at. So it's actually, this is super useful because there's a lot of times when I'm looking at a new specimen, a new material, something I've never looked at, and I'll see something like a particle that's embedded in the surface. And I just won't know what it is, right? And so that's when I hit it with the EDS and figure out like, oh, that's like a sulfur deposit. That's real bad, right? This steel was not made correctly. Um, so it's nice to be able to visually see, uh, you know, things at high mag, but then also get the chemical information about them as well. A lot of times you're supposed to keep these rooms super clean, but my lab tech and I both have dogs. So there's almost always dog hairs on our specimen. So we've gotten really good at recognizing those and saying, no, 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 it's fine. That's not them. That's just, you know, <laughs> and actually, it's kind of fun because when you get the beam going real hot, you can just you can melt the dog hairs off. You can just focus on the dog hair and you just see it kind of crumble and vaporize. So um, I'm sure that the guy who comes and services DSEM is not super pleased about all the dog hair vapors that get deposited on all the stuff in there, but whatever. That's how it works. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's our kind of our workforce for failure analysis type stuff. Any questions on this or anything that was out there? Yeah, it's like CSI, but with metal failures. Um, so like how many, are there a lot of electron microscopes in Alaska or is that like the only one? It's not the only one, there aren't a lot. This is the only one of its kind in Alaska. This is a variable pressure microscope. So it allows us to essentially drop the pressure in there, um, which I don't think anybody else operates a VP or an environmental SEM. UAF might have one, but I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it, it lets us do wet samples and living samples, okay. which we don't do. I do metals. I don't, if I'm, if I'm gonna put it in there, I just clean it up, I dry it off, I put it in there. If you're going to do non-conductive samples, you have to gold plate them. So that's our little gold plater over there. It's a little sputter coater. So you put your sample in there and it, you know, vaporizes gold. Living? Well, well, if it's living, that's when you need the variable pressure. Okay. So a typical SEM, you'd have to gold plate everything. Even like if you're going to put like a fly, which we did when we first got it. We like dug around the ground, found a bunch of like little bugs, stuck them, gold plated them. <laughs> the of course, it's the first thing we're going to But... Yeah, but actually the guy who installed it, he was kind of weird. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll freeze ants. I'll super glue them to the stage, and then I'll look at them under the, the scope, and as they warm up, they start to come back to life. And I was like, you guys have issues, man. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to somebody about that. But, yeah, we don't do anything like that. If it goes on the scope, it's dead already. Let's, you know? let's rotate take some people through here so they can get yeah, a closer yeah, yeah, look at it. Yep. Here, I'll bounce over here to the next room. Yeah, it's not doing anything right can you stream in from your phone? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Are you yes. going to these two labs? And I was going to go down to the materials testing lab, too. Okay. How much, I mean, do you have another 10 minutes to um, spare? Yeah, absolutely. I think they just had your lab tours going straight up to 8. Um, so I think okay. there's also We have to have HVAC. HVAC. There's okay. HVAC, too. Yeah. So who's doing that one? That's it. Oh, yeah. So you're sharing them. So okay. be mindful of them. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of run through this stuff. Is he aware of it? Is he waiting around? Yeah, he's yeah. up. He's up. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be done. Yeah, I don't know where we were supposed to find him if he's already there or not. Yeah. The problem is what you give me rolling in. Yeah. Could you actually stage him in HVAC and we could just go up there with sure. this crew group? Um, right after this, or do you want to go first to? We'll go downstairs first and then we'll go upstairs. Yeah, downstairs so grab, and then. We'll this and then yeah. we'll find so we're talking about what timeline? 10 more minutes? Uh, probably more like 15, but I mean, like, so I'll, 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 I'll 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to. Come next door uh, to sort of file in. Uh, <coughs> All right. <laughs> Scary looking machinery. Wait for this. 
of studs that they all neck down really small. They stretched out before they went up, which is what we wanted them to do. And then we had a few that we pulled on and they just went snap like glass. And as it turns out, when we put them on a fancy welder, we figured how somebody just grabbed the wrong bolts. Uh, might have been somebody who was like, ah, I need eight, I only have six. And he, oh, these two will do, right? But the grade markings were different. They were different bolts. So um, yeah, that's kind of some of the stuff we do. We have all sorts of fun stuff. Those are resin traps. We will do carbon fiber uh, composites. We'll actually lay up the carbon fiber composites in composite sandwich beams, which I'll show you a couple of those down there. It's actually not that hard. You just need a vacuum pump, a bunch of plastic, and some resin traps. Um, and that's a muffle furnace over there, so that thing will go to, you can't like melt steel, but we know like, you know, pretty darn high. Uh, high enough to heat treat whatever we need. And so we'll heat treat our own steel um, in that. That's always a fun lab, watching people almost burn themselves and pull red hot pieces of steel out and dump it in a tank of oil. Um, yeah, these are the sort of things we do because the state of Alaska, for some reason, gives me the leeway to do whatever I want in my classes. So this is sort of a playground. Um, any questions about this stuff? What's that? That? Yeah. That's an abrasive saw. It's, it's literally just a big hood because it sprays cool all over the place. When you heat samples up, metal samples, too hot, they change. So has anybody here ever gotten a piece of metal like red hot? It changes the microstructure completely. So if I'm trying to do a failure analysis and figure out why something failed, and I change the metal before I look at it, that's like walking into a crime scene just kicking stuff around, spitting <laughs> everywhere, right? You don't do that. So when we make cuts, we make sure everything stays very cool. It never goes above, you know, we're talking about 100, 100 F. If you stay down low, below 100 F, like, you're not going to change anything. So, yeah. Yeah. That's probably the dirtiest thing in here, to be honest with you. That's like every once in a while we'll pay an undergrad and just go in there and scrape out all the junk and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Sorry about that. Um, anything else? We're going to ask Mary where we break everything. Not break really big stuff. We break smaller things. Oh, that's still loaded. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, that's a big one. Testing 
lab. This is essentially the smash it, break it lab that we use. So a lot of times, the only way to get information about how a material is going to behave mechanically is to actually break it, to pull it and see how it stretches, where it fails, right? So um, that is a um, universal testing machine. I mean, it's essentially just two big hydraulic grips that come in and grab whatever you want and just pull it to failure. And so it's a, uh, what, 110, I think it's 110 kips, that, that load frame, that's 110,000 pounds, right? So we're talking like a car is like a couple thousand pounds, right? right? So yeah, we can break almost anything with that within, within reason. Um, so we do that. We have a couple hardness testers over here. So we'll basically poke it and see how big a dent it makes. Yeah, here in that, but you get the point. Right? If it's not very hard, it makes a big dent. If it's really hard, it makes a small dent. We got this guy, which is just a smaller load cell with a, or a smaller testing frame with a refrigerator on it. Because sometimes temperature actually affects our material properties and our material behavior pretty significantly. So everybody's seen like a James Bond, but I have like the lock and the spray. It's really nice. You could make it cold and then hit it and it shatters, right? Yeah, that actually happens. So cool when it happens in James Bond, he gets into the secret vault or whatever. Not cool when that's a piece of kit on the north slope at negative 50 and it shatters all of a sudden. So we spend a lot of time here verifying that materials behave as they should at the temperatures that they're going to be operating in. So this guy's an impact tester. This, this is slow strain rate testing. So we're basically pulling something real slow, that guy over there. This one is we're going to drop a big honking weight on it. So the springs up there actually help, help us to get a little bit more oomph that will shoot the weight downward. Um, and so that one we use for testing you know, it's basically the impact load. How does something handle, not just like a slow, steady loading, but something smashing into it? Because that's the worst case scenario. When you load something really fast, that's when it tends to kind of uh, behave the most like glass, right? The most brittle. So this thing over here is another impact tester. This is what's called a Sharpie tester. And the Sharpie tester, it's locked up now. You don't want people getting hurt by it. But usually what we do is we take these specimens, which look like this. A sharpie specimen. We make a really sharp notch in them. Right? We put them in there between two anvils. And then this giant hammer swings down and smashes it right here. Right? And so, you know, and it shoots the specimen off this way. And what we're looking for, and I do want to see that. Oh, oh. already foul. Um, yeah, the idea here is conservation of energy. That that hammer, we move it up on one side, right? It has a certain amount of potential energy. Sorry, about potential energy at some point in your glasses, right? And then we let it go and it smashes into this specimen and it absorbs some energy in order to break the specimen. And it swings up on the other side. Is it gonna swing up as high on the other side as where it started? No, right? Because of that energy it lost. So what we do is we measure how far it went up on the other side and the difference between where it started and how far it swung on the first swing tells us how much energy the material absorbed. We want steel and other materials, thank you, to absorb a lot of energy. What do you, this is going to absorb a lot of energy. If it's behaving brittly, then they'll absorb less. So if it behaves like glass, it'll absorb almost nothing. It'll fracture right down the center. Um, and so this is kind of like a, a stress test for our metals. We figure out, like, we put it in the worst possible condition. Big, sharp point, right? heavy impact load, and we see what it does. And the nice thing is there's a lot of testing information about pipeline steels and other materials out there where I can look up and know how a material is supposed to be hit. How many joules is it supposed to absorb on impact energy by Sharpie? And if it's way low, something's wrong with the material, right? So, yeah. I mean, there's other stuff around here, but, like, I'm not going to show you everything. I want to get you up to the HVAC lab. Like I said, it's a veritable playground. Jenga. I don't think we've ever smacked a Jenga block, but I think it'd be funny to do it. So, I mean, no, you shouldn't do that. That's <laughs> um, safety first. No, as long as it's safe, I'll pretty much do it. So, uh, yeah. But this can be obviously, well, it's maybe not obvious. It can be really unsafe if you're too close to it and hit you. It would be a bad day. I mean, I'm tenured, but I don't know. I think if I smacked somebody with a hammer, I'd still get fired. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I will, I'll, I'll kind of leave you with this. I'll leave you with this last bit that 
I know you don't know this because you haven't been to other schools. I've been to a lot of other schools. I can tell you we have better facilities than I'd say the vast majority of R1 research schools in this country. People who come here from those sort of schools, I'm talking places like Ohio State, Penn State, you know, Yale, places like that. They come here and they see what we have and they say, wow. Like, not that they don't necessarily have the same thing or have better. They're just super surprised that a, a, an institution that's pre, pre, predominantly undergraduate teaching institution has this stuff. So what I'd argue is, as a pitch for UAA, if you come here, you're going to get to use stuff that you're not going to get to use if you go to a bigger school, right? They'll have the cool stuff, but there'll be graduate students working on it, not you. Here, we're kind of stuck, right? Because I don't have PhD students. I have you. So I have to make it with you, which means you're going to have to learn how to use this equipment. And you're going to have to learn how to do the work that I need done um, for the oil and gas industry or whoever. Um, and if nothing else, we use these labs for all of our actual labs. So my material science class, we spend a lot of time with it. Um, yeah. So just consider that when you go to other schools, a lot of the stuff I was kind of taken in by it when I went to my school, uh, they showed us all that stuff. And I was telling somebody else this lasers, big stainless steel pressure vessels, and I thought, this is so cool. And then I went there, and we didn't get to use any of it, like literally none of it, until I was a graduate student. So I feel like it's false advertising. So make sure you ask when you go to tour schools, ask their undergraduates, like, how much of that equipment do you actually get to use? Find out for sure, because I can tell you if you come here, your undergraduates are our primary business. So educating you is what we do. Um, so you're going to have to get actually some pretty world-class facilities. Well, maybe not world-class. I'm kind of inflating a little bit. You get some really high-end facilities um, for a heck of a good value in terms of what you're paying in tuition. And you actually get to use the stuff and learn about it. So I don't know. That's why I'd come here if I was considering it. Um, any questions on this stuff? Matchy Breaky Lab? <laughs> Oh, I love it. You, I mean, do you not want to see stuff smashed? I mean, how many how many high school students are like, no, nah, I really just don't like to see things broken. They're like, it upsets me. No, of course. <laughs> Smash everything we can. Yeah, they have to really take them out. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, trust me. I understand. I'm a grown child, so I also like to break things. You got to come to school here, man. <laughs> when, when you pay your first uh, first uh, tuition bill, we'll right. unlock it and <laughs> go to town. UAA student. Breaking yeah. the box. Any other questions? If you think of anything, just email me. Uh, you can find me on the website. Call in. Last name. I'm the vampire, but with an eye. Uh, <laughs> all right. To all the right. HVAC lab. To the HVAC lab. Very nice meeting all of you. So this is a thermal systems design lab, and also we have um, some turbo machinery here. Does anybody know, all of you know what a turbo machine is? Have you seen a fan? Fan, a pump. So if you have a dishwasher at home, you have a, a turbo machine because uh, you have a pump inside the dishwasher which pumps the water. If you have a refrigerator, you have a turbo machine at home because there is a pump inside. If you own a, comp a computer, all of you have a computer, right? A laptop or a PC. So you see a small fan which actually helps you cool that. That's a turbo machine. Okay. So what we do here is that we test these machines or we design them and bring them and test them here. Okay. One of the examples here is what I have is these ones which are designed by students. And then we plug in them here and then we test them how they work, you know, what's the efficiency what's the power requirement and what's the pressure they can develop and everything, okay? So I'll show you here um, the experimental apparatus here we have, if you, if you can come around here. So, this is a pump, just a single pump, another pump is here, so you can have multiple pumps working at the same time or just one of them working. And what you see in Sahid, something like this is called impeller. So this is something which develops kinetic energy and then that kinetic energy is transported into pressure. And then what you want from a pump is that to get some pressure and then transport the fluid from one point to another point, okay? So 
we bring this kind, so this is designed by students, as I said, they calculated, they did everything, and then they 3D printed these parts. Then you can put them inside here and then test them. So for example, if I put this one here and we have here a, an interface where we can control what, what's going on here. So what happens is, is from this um, water tank and then water is pumped to the, through the inlet. This is inlet, sorry. From the inlet, through the inlet pipe, it's pumped, it goes to the pump and the pump develops some energy and some pressure and then it discharges it out back to the tank. So in this case, we just wanted to recirculate and see it. For example, here, so you can control from this interface. So what you see is a picture of it. And if you want the pump to run, let's say at 80% of its capacity, I already turned it on this thing. And then you probably will notice that the impeller is starting to rotate, right? Do you see it? It's fast, you can't see, right? So if you can reduce the speed, let's say about 20% of it, nothing? 50% of the speed. Fifty. Oh, that's accidental. Students, when they're working, napkin fell inside. <laughs> yeah, but we don't want to have actually dirt there because we want it to be clean, but that's accidental. So uh, here you see, you know, at what speed it's rotating, 900 RPM, and you can see the heat generated, which means the pressure which is developed by the pump, and so on. And the efficiency also can be read, you know, about now it's working about 40% efficiency and so on. So that's what we do here. So you design something, bring it here, and then test it, okay? Uh, another thing what you see here is also, um, a turbo machine, in this case, it's a turbine. So a pump, what a pump does is it just pushes a fluid from one position to another position. So if you get, for, for example, water from municipality, which comes to your home, is pumped using a pump. Uh, in case of hydro turbine, what you have is if you have a falling water, like a fountain or whatever, or waterfall, then you want to harvest that water and then generate electricity, okay? So the water flowing, from because it has potential energy when it comes down and hits some part of a machine, what it does it it rotates it. Okay, <coughs> that rotation is transformed into electrical energy, and then what you get here. So this is an example of a Pelton turbine. I can't show you how it's working because I have to transfer all this part to this one. So that's why I can show you right now. Okay, because it requires uh, an interface with a computer. Now this is connected to that one, so I have to disconnect and connect it to this to run, okay? So these are some of the examples of turbo machines we have here. And another thing what you see here is this is to test a fan. So somewhere there is a fan, an axial fan. So what a fan is something which transports air into your space where you live in and then um, it conditions as a place. So for example, it can heat it, but it can cool it or recirculate air inside the zone where you are living in. So what we, so what we do here is also we test the fan and then see how it's performing, how it's well doing or not doing, okay? So just another, so we measure pressures at different points and then we can find what pressure is developed by the fan. Um, here on the other side, what you see, this is an example of a heating of a house. So it's just a simple demonstration which exactly replicates what's happening when you are heating or cooling a house or just a room. So this is the room, a simplified small room. And the duct outside, what you see on the ceiling is actually connected to the outside. So you can bring in fresh air from the outside and here there are different types of coils which sometimes heat or sometimes cool the air depending on what you want. And then that air, heated air is then 
or cool air is humidified. So we have, we will put water here, humidified at a given temperature, at whatever temperature you want, you condition it and bring it to the zone, okay? So here you can control, this is also controlled by a computer, so you can connect to this, uh, to this port and then with a the laptop you can control so what you can control is how much air you want from the air so here are the dampers which means you know some openings and closings you see probably here this is called a damper also similar damper here so you can control how much opening you have so you can control how much air you are bringing in and how much air you can heat or cool humidify or dehumidify depending on the need and then supply to the desired area, okay? So that's how it works. So you can see this uh, demonstrate for students when they are taking thermal system design courses. Another thing which you see here is the window air conditioner. Probably you have seen this one, right? Just a small box which you put on a window and then either heats or cools the, the room. So this is, uh, we dismantled that window air conditioner and then we can show, you know, to students how actually it works, okay? So you can see this is a cooling coil, it's a heating coil, and this is a refrigerant. And then we can measure actually what temperature comes out of the cooling coil and what temperature comes out of the heating coil, what's the temperature going in, what's the temperature going out, and so on. This just essentially demonstrates the thermodynamics of window air conditioning. They can measure it and then uh, whatever they measure, they can then later compare it to the calculations they do theoretically. Okay. Uh, in that room, if you would like to see, we have uh, batteries and so what another thing here we do is uh, we work on renewable energy sources. So renewable energy sources like wind, photovoltaics. Do you guys know what is a photovoltaic is? Solar panels, right? So we have on the rooftop, we have solar panels installed, okay? There are solar panels installed. The way they work is they take the solar energy and that solar energy is converted into electricity, okay? From the, you can come in, don't, don't be afraid, you can come here. So, so we have the, the photovoltaics or the PVs up there. And through this duct, they are connected to the batteries. This is the battery storages. So you can store electricity, but this is just a DC, right? So direct current electricity. So if you want to have this one directly connected to an appliance, you have to have some sort of equipment, which is called inverter. That's on the other side of this, uh, under the window, the other side of this wall. And then you can connect that directly to the AC. And then that's a demonstration also, okay? So we have photovoltaics up there, which produce, you know, help us produce electricity with renewable energy. You can either store it into the battery or you can use it directly through the inverter. So these are the things we do here. Do you have any questions? Yeah, so go around, feel free to touch everything, have a look. <laughs>